Welcome to the Camp Owners Podcast. On today's show, we have Ruby Compton from Ruby Outdoors and Go Camp Pro. Ruby is an amazing resource to the industry, and today we're going to explore all issues related to being a better boss, how bosses can make the difference in the experience our camp staff have, and why they keep coming back. It's going to be a great show, everyone. Welcome to the Camp Owners Podcast. Welcome to the Camp Owners Podcast, a space for camp owners to talk about the unique aspects of camp ownership and get inspired by each other. We're going to sit down with camp industry experts, leaders, and fellow camp owners to hear how the camp dream transpired for them, learn from each other, and discuss some of the biggest issues in the private camp industry. Hi, everybody. My name is Howie Grossinger, and I am with Camp Robin Hood, a private day camp in the suburbs of Toronto. Hello, everybody. I am Kelly Shuna, co-owner and director of Hidden Pines Ranch Day Camp in Stillwater, Minnesota. If you are looking to find and subscribe to the Camp Owners Podcast, you can either find us online at gocamp.pro slash owners pod or by searching for us in your favorite podcast app. Finally, if you're listening to this and think it'd be useful to other camp owners or aspiring camp owners in your circle, please feel free to send them a note to listen. We would love to give a huge shout out to our podcast sponsor, Camp Brain. We are very grateful to Camp Brain for their sponsorship of the show. Camp Brain is camp management software, which serves over 1,300 camps. They've been doing this since 1994 with 45 plus dedicated staff to meet your every need. Camp Brain supports their clients with an unmatched desire to delight them with a passionate, friendly voice just a phone call away. We're at that time of year where I know the Camp Rain staff, knowing them for as well as I do, that they are always available, willing, and more than capable of uh, serving their clients and helping everyone through any uh, issues that they may be facing or any problems they need solved with their amazing software. Kelly and I encourage you to check them out at campbrain.com or give them a call at 866 866- 485-8885. Well, Kelly, uh, here we are again, another episode, super pumped for this. We are really excited to be talking about how to be a better boss with the one and only podcaster and trainer extraordinaire, Ruby Compton of Ruby Outdoors and Go Camp Pro. We're super excited to have her. Um, we, we not only like to talk about how we can become better bosses, but also how we can train our leadership teams to be better bosses to those they supervise. Kelly, this is a topic that I'm so looking forward to exploring as as camp directors, uh, you know, um, training future bosses, future leaders, and how to be the best boss possible is something that I've, you know, look forward to enhancing my skills and uh, really excited to have Ruby here. I know you are too. I am too. And to have a little crossover from another Go Camp Pro podcast, right? Cross pollinating. I love it. And extraordinaire is so true, Ruby. You are a camp extraordinaire. So I am just thrilled to learn from you today. So I think we'd like to start off as we typically do in inviting you to share your camp story. How did this dream of working within camp transpire for you? Uh, well, I, thanks for having me on y'all. This is a very, it's, it's special and it is especially humbling when owners are the ones who come to me and say, Hey, I think you have something to teach me. So I think right there, you're showing being a good boss, uh, because the best bosses are always learning. So again, thanks for, thanks for inviting me on. Um, as far as the question of, my camp journey. I was that kid who went to summer camp and loved it. I loved it so much. I loved it so much that when I went on my family beach trip, I was uh, in my head creating summer camp at the beach where I was the camp counselor for all my imaginary campers and would like write out a schedule and we had rest hour and it was, it was shenanigans, Uh, (laughs) but I just loved it so much. Um, And in college, I worked at a day camp. It was a big YMCA camp. We opened up a resident camp over the summers that I worked there, which was a big deal. That led me to teaching outdoor education um, down in Alabama, which really shaped 
how, what kind of camp leader and educator I became. Um, that led the way to me um, getting offered a job up here in Western North Carolina, where I live now. And I was a camp director for about four years for a small nature-based camp. Um, and then uh, three years ago, I'm almost at the three-year anniversary, I started my own company doing consulting and training for camps and essentially working as a pinch hitter um, for whatever camps need and then doing training like CPR, first aid, lifeguarding, raft guide, whatever it is folks need. Um, so I, you know, when people say like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an educator. That's what I put on my taxes. I'm a facilitator and I'm a space holder. Those are the, the primary things that I do. Mm, space holder. That's a new, mm -hmm. I like hearing in that. I liked hearing your story <laughs> too, Ruby, thinking about all the different positions you've held and the type of camps you've worked at. I did not know that you helped to start a resident camp. That's, I would like to hear more about that story sometime. That's really cool. But I think that this really adds to our conversation then and having listeners hear your perspective, having been in all those positions and different types of camps and roles. So I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. We would like, you know, Howie and I were talking about different questions and what we wanted to ask you. And the thing we wanted to start off with talking about was why do you think this is such an important topic for camp owners and directors to be discussing? Sure. I, I imagine that if I asked you, um, wouldn't it be nice if most of your staff would return every summer? that, you know, like most camp directors generally are going to be like, yeah, it'd be really nice if I had more returning staff. And the reality of it is that people leave bad bosses. Now, I think that's more true in the rest of the world uh, where you don't have as often a job that is, you know, from June to August, and then it has a definite end date. But the reality of it is, and I certainly fall into this category too, people leave positions because of management and because of supervisors. And so if we can become better bosses, then folks are more likely to stick around. They're more likely to invest uh, their own ownership, blood, sweat, and tears into the company that you're running um, and continue to pass on great traditions. Um, I, I think about the people that I work with mean so much. I spent this past summer working at a family of restaurants. It's a place that I've worked the last couple of years. And one of the reasons I love working there is that they hire good campy people. And I just love the people that I work with. And um, that it, it makes all the difference in the world. So if we can think about ourselves as not only running a business, but also cultivating people uh, and growing people and growing leaders, that's going to help us be more more effective in our jobs. And the reality of it is that we can't lead the way we were led. We have to be better. Um, and that's hard. <laughs> I recognize that that's hard. Um, but that is what is demanded of us by the generations that come after us. When, when you, Ruby, when you think about, you know, we talk a lot about camp culture and camp culture can be this all encompassing you know, um, word that could speak to, it, you know, inclusion and diversity and, you know, uh, the program, for example. But as it relates to the culture where you can, you know, when you walk into a camp and do consulting or you walk into a place in the summer, like, are, is your radar on knowing if this is a culture where there's leadership and bosses that, you know, have formulated, like, is it tangible for you? Is that something that, you know, is your radar on that? And, and if so, could you maybe explain how, you know, you can walk away and say they have a culture of being really good bosses and, and I can see it the moment I step in there. Maybe you can give some insight on, on how that, you know, that manifests itself when you're doing tours and training and other things like that. Totally. That's a great question. And, and I would say the way it manifests is in how the counselors treat their kids. And you can tell a lot by how the staff are being treated, uh, how they're being supported, how you know problem solving happens when they go to a leader, how they're asking for help or not asking for help, how much patience the, the leaders seem to have or not. I think all of that is symptoms of if they have great bosses <laughs> and you can tell a ton by the kind of kindness and patience and um, skills that the staff have with their campers. Oh, I like that Ruby. Oh, I like that so much. I, oh, that's just such a good litmus test. I, that reminds me of Michael Brandwine when I listened to him at the national conference, he had, he talks a lot about if a kid comes to you and needs something, 
about right away in that moment, not just shushing them or, you know, turn away right away. So turn around right away and acknowledge that kid, because how can you expect a kid to grow a sense of self and positive self-identity if they're ignored, if not mm-hmm. right in that moment, even if it's a, oh, just a minute or a finger. Um, so it's all those little things and about us to giving that to our staff. So, Ooh, I think that's, I love that. That's some great sage wisdom and observation. Good question for her, Holly. I like that. <laughs> I, I also think, Ruby, you know, for me and, and only from my own experience, and, and we all sort of hope we're that boss that people who work for us will think fondly of. And, you know, I, I almost feel I can only speak for myself. Like, I, I just I just want people to, you know, feel good about the experience that I provided and that they knew that I was with them uh, along the way every step. And for me, and I, I'm curious about you know, your thoughts on this. For me, sometimes it's as simple as, you know, starting the hiring process off, you know, in a way that lets them know or applicants know perhaps, you know, who they're going to have a relationship with. And I know that there's organizations of all sizes and some of them have huge HR, you know, things. But when we're talking of the private camp industry, you know, sometimes, you know, we're as hands-on as any you know, business owners, you know, for me, um, I've, you know, I've been, I've had the process from my father-in-law, Larry, who's been in camp for 60 years. He, you know, the gateway to getting a job is through the owner, right? The owner does all the interviews. And, and that's a tradition that I've carried on. You know, I, I'm proud to say to my leadership staff, Hey, I'm the one who's personally vetted these people. They've come through me. Now it's time consuming and people look at me and say, hey man, like that's something when I become an owner, I just, I'm gonna pass that on to somebody else. But for me, and I'm just curious about your reaction as you talk to different bosses, like, you know, for me, that's been um, something I've prided myself on because I think it starts a relationship that says I'm in it with you. And while I may not be your direct supervisor when we ultimately at camp, I'm, you know, this is an important relationship I, in describing that, you know, how many, you know, what, what's your reaction to hearing that or, you know, um, it's worked for me, but, you know, not everyone can do it. So it's funny because you saying that actually makes me think of several jobs I've had outside of the camp industry. Um, so like, for instance, I worked a, a Christmas job one year at a local retail store and I legitimately, I, I went through the HR department because it's a big company. I didn't meet my manager until I'd been working for two weeks. So like the person who scheduled me and it was all done online, I did not meet them (laughs) until I was like working a shift two weeks into to be in there. It was like, oh, this doesn't feel good. I don't like this. I don't feel like I know who to go to. Um, I've, I've had in the camp world, I had a a boss that hired me uh, and that was done in tandem with one of the the owners or executive directors of that, of that organization. And then that the person that hired me, um, she ended up leaving before the summer really started. And again, there was this moment of like, but like, I, I know her sort of, I mean, I had like an hour long conversation with her. So I think your point about there during that hiring process, there being that touch point of like, this is, you know, these are the people that you're going to have interactions with. Um, these are people that are going to be supporting you. These are going to be your advoc- advocates. The, the places that I've had more conversation with those folks who I ultimately had more of a relationship with, those were definitely places where I stuck around and, and they felt like they were managed better. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. when you had said people leave bad bosses, what I was thinking in my head was I want to be the boss. It's really hard to leave. Yeah, and me it's, too. It's seasonal. You know, again, yeah. like you said, we're not a typical job where you're with them all the time and it's seasonal. So it is more uh, varied who comes back for that reason. But I want to be the boss where it kills you to call me and tell me that you can't work for me. And even, you know, maybe you get a little verklempt and then I get verklempt and get emotional about it, but I want it to be painful in a good way to leave working for me because you just loved it so much. Like that would be the epitome. And I think I can see it in Howie's face too, that that I think is the goal of how I want it to be. And, and it sometimes is starting off by being that person who hires them. So right away, there is this connection um, to us and to our organization and our camps. And, and in many ways, it's confirmation, you know, whether you doubted whether you were a good boss or not, like those moments, you know, are really encouraging. And, and we've all had our own varied stories of, 
you know, um, lengthy emails or handwritten letters or, you know, in, in my case recently, uh, a real uh, determination for a staff member who's moving on to actually, because everything's a Zoom call these days, uh, you know, wanted to get on Zoom and just to really have that moment to, to just reflect on the time at camp. And I think for all of us who do this, you know, that that should serve as, you know, an acknowledgement that, you know, you're you're doing something right when 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 that's go, uh, when when that happens, and I think Kelly, that 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 uh, description of I want to be the boss that everyone doesn't want to leave. I, I really love that. I think that's that's a really good way. And and how you get there is going to be different for everybody. But but I think Ruby set the table for the kind of role modeling and kindness and and how you shape the culture of of your of your camp. Well, and can I add to that that I actually told my staff every year, I want to be the best boss you've ever had. And to be abundantly clear, that doesn't mean you're going to like me all the time. Like there are going to be times that what you want and what I have to do as the person who's, you know, protecting the organization, like those are going to butt heads sometimes. Uh, and also I'm going to advocate for you when I can. Um, and I think just by saying that, and that was typically followed up by, look, y'all are here helping me achieve my life goals. It only seems fair that I do some work towards helping you achieve whatever your life goals are. And so part of the, the one-on-one -on -one conversations, kind of the formal evaluation process I had with the staff is I always asked them like, what are some goals that you have? They can be related to camp or not. But I'd love for you to tell me what they are. And, and if there's a way I can help, awesome. And like, don't be afraid to ask. But maybe that just looks like recommendations at the end of the year. Like, that's cool too. I'm, I am here to support you. <laughs> and I hope that you will see my actions back that up. Um, and, and if they aren't like, I hope you will tell me, uh, because I need that feedback too. I'm still growing. I'm still learning as a boss. And so if I, if there's something I'm really doing, that's not working for you, I need to know that as well. And we can keep growing together. I, I think that's awesome because, you know, I think about, um, the many bosses that we have around camp. And I know that we're going to jump all over the place on, on topics and questions we've, we, we plan on asking you, but. But, you know, within a single camp organization, you know, you have multiple people who could be seen as bosses. And I find that over the years, one of the one of the things that I hear most or asked most amongst new bosses, new division directors who are going to supervise 10, 12, 15 staff is like, so how do I get off on the right foot? Right. You know, and I think, Ruby, you speak to that in your last sort of I, I have this picture painted of what that first convert, you know, aside from all of our, you know, uh, games we're going to play and get to know you and all. But there comes a point where the boss is going to be, you know, sharing their thoughts on their leadership, what they want to be doing uh, for and with their staff and you know, the roles that they have, the hats they have to wear. So maybe, you know, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, is there, is there any, you know, if you're in a training situation with, you know, division directors and new people, like maybe you can sort of expand on that a little bit. I'm curious to hear, you know, what, what you think the path to success, uh, aside from these, you know, the, the great gems you've already thrown out. So a couple of resources that um, I hand to any new leader, uh, and I talk about these in conference sessions I do on this. Um, so one is the book, The Coaching Habit, The Coaching Habit, and it walks through seven questions to have, uh, seven questions to ask. And this is typically like the, you know, somebody comes and knocks on your door and says, hey, can I talk to you? And, and this is a roadmap for how to have those conversations. And so often we go into problem solving mode and and trying to problem solve for the person versus being that guide on the side and, and helping the person find the solution on their own, which then they're going to have more ownership over, or they're going to opt into asking you for help or asking others for help, right? So these are all really important skills for us to have in a group dynamic. So the coaching habit, like 100% changed the way that I lead and, and how I talk to folks. Um, I also think the, the podcast, the book, the system of radical candor, um, the, especially that first season of the podcast, I'll tell folks like, just go pick out an episode 
that looks interesting to you and listen to it. They're 25 minutes. It's easy. But that whole system of care personally challenged directly, I think those are great foundational skills that, again, it's always funny when I go home and I'm like visiting with my parents or seeing my dad be in charge of a track meet where like he's the boss. Right. And I and, you know, I grew up seeing that leadership and it's not till I was away for a little while and came back and have my own opinions about leadership that I go, oh, you're trying to get people to do stuff like totally the wrong way. <laughs> That's not the way I would do it. Right. Uh, and, and it's just a funny moment. But again, it, it goes to we can't just assume the way we've been taught is the only way and the way that we've been led is the only way. And so I think pointing out to your staff, like, however you were led, you don't have to lead that way. You can take the things that you think were great and use them. And the things that you don't like, let's change and make it better and make it easier. The things that you've seen bosses struggle with, you don't necessarily have to struggle with those things. Let's see if we can figure those out. Um, and and I, I can't speak enough to encouraging good, strong communication in both directions. Um, one of the, the I, like the greatest moment, one of my greatest moments in camping, it's going to sound really ridiculous, is I made a really stupid mistake. And the mistake was that I uh, instituted a curfew for the staff midway through the summer. So midway through the summer, I was like, you know what? everybody's tired. You're staying out the, the staff lounge too late. We're having to police that. I'm not into it. Everybody has to be in bed by 11 o'clock. Like lights out. You got to be in bed. <laughs> and my staff did not like that. Shocking, right? Um, but what I'm so proud of is that how many folks in our one-on-ones at the end of the summer said that was really crummy. Like it felt like we were being treated like children. And the fact that I had created a relationship and rapport with folks that they felt like that they could say that to me and that I wasn't gonna get super mad or fire them or, you know, not hire them back next summer, but they were able to just offer that feedback. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I've, I've made a mistake. <laughs> and I think that that is a great reminder of just remembering that we're humans. I think it's really easy as camp leaders to forget that our camp staff are not just camp robots who do everything perfectly, that we have mistakes, we have fears, we have anxieties, um, and we're going to mess up sometimes, and we're going to do stuff not the way you want us to do it. And um, so we, we have to be human, and we have to remember that our staff are human, and we have to acknowledge, like Michael Brandwein says, we have to make mistakes publicly and acknowledge it, um, and and own up to that stuff. Like these are these are the pieces that make folks really appreciate you, and and when you can show a staff member like I'm human you're human and I'm going to trust you and appreciate you and respect you as a human. That goes a long way for setting a great foundation for then respecting and treating them well as an employee. I also feel, you know, in hearing you say that is that, you know, generationally, you know, we know that the age of our staff are, you know, you know, we'll call, you know, we know that they're Gen Z and all this stuff. And there's a lot of pressure, you know, camp should be a place, and you know, I feel where, you know, they can come to a place and, and not feel that sense or need for perfection, and that everything is riding on this or that. And, and because unfortunately, they've grown up in an environment where, you know, whether it's, you know, the perceptions of, social media or the impact of social media or home life or achievement or whatever, I, I still strongly believe camp, camp is that place where we can reassure not only our campers, but obviously our staff who are being hired to do a job that, you know, you know, fallibility is, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the deal, right? Because we're only getting better mm -hmm. when that happens. And I, I just that really resonates with me because I'm a big fan of, you know, of, you know, uh, coddling of the American mind and, and all that stuff, like all this great stuff that's out there about a generation. And I think it's influenced, I, I quite frankly think it's influenced the way we have had to become bosses because, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, growing up, whether it was, it was the time that I worked at the local pharmacy as a teenager and stocking shelves and the kind of boss I had then, or maybe my even my very first job helping with kids, you know, the evolution of the bosses has been kind of obvious. And so I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about even in your experience from your early days in the industry, the bosses you had and, you know, how you've seen, you know, if, if you can point to anything that sort of shifted, you know, your a very 
obvious way things have changed if that if that is in fact the case uh yeah i am very fortunate that i had very fantastic bosses uh especially early on in my career um but i but to answer your question one of the things that i think is not so much about an evolution of time but but this is a system that i talk about sometimes with folks when i'm teaching this material is i worked at a, a ymca camp that opened up a resident camp over the span of time that i was working there so i'd worked three summers at day camp and then my fourth summer rolled up into leadership team as a head counselor um, and that was the summer that we uh, opened resident camp and so that meant there were a whole lot more leaders on our leadership team but also we had some more year-round folks so from our day camp world, we had um, a director who'd been at camp almost since the camp had started. Uh, and it was a camp that was only about 20 years old at that point, like 15 years old. Um, and then we brought in another director. So it was our boys camp director and our girls camp director. And their styles could not have been more different. <laughs> and I, I remember like watching this tension play out and being like, huh, this is very, very interesting. So the, the boys camp director who had history at camp um, was notable for like playing favorites. Like everybody on leadership team previously was like one of his friends um, and, but like super charismatic, likable guy. And so I like to think about him as the friend first kind of leader. Like he is your friend first. And I remember him saying this in a training. Um, I do this thing because so-and-so is my friend. He does it for me because he's my friend. And then you're my employee, but you're my friend first. So then our girls camp director came in very different backgrounds and she is a hundred percent boss first. And like, she can't be friends with you unless you're doing your job well. And, and so like, I saw these two just collide <laughs> and there was tension and it was not great, but we ran a great successful camp and they eventually became very good friends after a couple of years and learned how to work together. But this, this very inherent difference in philosophies as far as like where that baseline respect is and motivation. So one of the times that I saw this like explode was we used to do a staff luau and it was always kind of midway through the summer. It was the staff appreciation event. It was usually at camp and, um, you know, food and hanging out of the pool and just the staff. And as day camp staff, when it was just a day camp, like it was this welcome opportunity to be at camp after hours when the kids weren't there and you're hanging out with the other staff. But once we had resident camp, the dynamic was really different and people didn't want to be at camp all the time. Right. And so we had our first luau that, that, uh, summer we had our first year of resident camp and like nobody showed up and my friend first boss he was so hurt he was so hurt he was like where y'all didn't come and you like you're attacking my friendship <laughs> and my boss first boss was kind of like yeah I, I think we missed some of the need here <laughs> you know and and so <laughs> I, 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 that's a, like I said, it's a system I teach because I want to help people. It's like a personality assessment. Like, where do you fall? Because I'm a boss first person. Like if you are not doing your job well, it's, I, I'll be honest. I'll be like, meh, are you a worthwhile human? Like I will ask that question in my brain, which is not a good question to ask, but I do. And so knowing this is what's so cruel, what knowing that if I'm in that place with someone where I'm like, Ugh, like you're not doing your job well, like what the heck? I don't, I don't know. Like, should you even be here? That actually what I need to do is I need to get that get to know them better on a personal level and find out what's going on right and <laughs> so it's just such a funny like crisscross irony thing um but i do think you see those sort of philosophies interact a bunch especially in camp mm, i don't know that i've ever this is new verbiage to me i don't know if i've ever heard it put that way of friend first leader versus boss first leader i don't even know if i even want to dive into what i am howie do we want to share that? I don't know. Let's not get know. that what personal here. <laughs> it's, <laughs> this I don't is know. not about us, Howie. This is not about us. We don't have to describe that. No. But well, it so depends on who you ask in my in my camp. Like, you know, if you ask my wife, Sari, she would give an answer. Yeah. And maybe and maybe if you ask my my daughter, who is a, you know, an emerging leader within camp, and she probably has a little bit of both of us as the leaders of camp and who knows. So that's maybe a private conversation <laughs> for you to have with my family, maybe <laughs> Kelly. So I don't know. How about the viewer? How about our listeners can talk with us at about a conference when we uh, see them privately yes. in the hallway? Yeah. Um, but I, for sure, I for sure be wounded if no one came to my luau. But then I would think about why. 
but you, I for sure be wounded at first. I love that though, Ruby. That's some really, really good food for thought, really good food for thought. And I think Howie's question about the generational thing is also intriguing to me because I've seen it in the way, like when you say Ruby, the way you were led doesn't mean you have to lead that way. So for me, it was a little bit of how I was, how I grew up and like parented and how I was led was how I was leading at first when I first owned camp. And it was the no news is good news. So for me, my staff also, I was trying not to let camp be burnt down and ruin it my first summer, like <laughs> yes, we're in yes. survival mode here. So I can't tell you how great you're doing, but it was a no news is good news. You know, in college in the nineties, I talked to my parents like once a month. I mean, it was probably when I got a parking ticket and I needed some money. So it was very much that way in leading in that I would approach a conversation if we needed to discuss it and there was an issue, but it was more, I assume they know they're doing great. And that really has been an area of growth for me in the past six years and being an owner and the director here is that that's, I've really had to push myself to way over communicate because I realized I was in the under communicating side and that when I would come to talk to them in the beginning, it was not great news. So now it's, they don't know because yeah. it's both good and bad, but that's, yeah. a, that's a generational thing I've seen. Well, for sure. And I think for some of us, depending on the age of staff that you work with, you know, are, are you going to be the boss with some healthy recognition that this might be their very first job and they've never had a boss and, and maybe thinking to yourself, what, what impression do I want them to leave of what a boss is? Because as you know, Ruby was very, you know, first thing she said is she's been very fortunate to have, you know, initially really good bosses, right? That, you know, she, she, you know, so I think we have, um, I think all of us, I'd like to think all of us think that they want to, you know, be that staff members first, very good boss. Um, so I always, I always think about that in terms of the education I can provide new staff with what it means to be a good employee at camp and staff member, but also what you can expect from me as the person who's hiring you. I, I, I feel like I'm more than just the person who signs your check or, you know, that, and, and I, I actually use that language and I, and I'd like to think that that helps. Um, but in addition to that, to your point, Kelly, about the 90s and no news is good news, I, I think we just have to come clean as the fact that we have a generation of staff who need validation more than ever in many ways. And they probably, um, you know, we talk about, and, and I know we've explored this in our camp, about the different ways that people respond to appreciation. And, and it's not the same for everybody. So, you know, just giving out, you know, the extra snack to say thank you. For some people, that's the best thing they'll ever have. But some people maybe just need that note or need that, you know, I'm just praying for the day where we can comfortably put our arm around our staff member once again in the future. But, you know, so so even as a good boss and Ruby, I, just knowing you the way that I do, like like just even getting inside, understanding what your individual staff members need so you can be a good boss, because being a good boss is different for everybody. And, and And if you can shape that in your interactions, I think that is a, you know, I, I think you see the results in, in what we started with is the kind of culture we're all going for. So I don't know if you, I, I'd invite you to comment anything that I've said, but that's sort of yeah. what I'm thinking now with Kelly's comments as well. Yeah, so smart. And, and um, that brings to mind two points. So one, I said I was a space holder earlier, and I think that that is something I would encourage folks to do more of this summer. Um, and what I mean by space holder. So one of the bosses that I had, had this brilliant way of knowing when you were the one who was going to be down building the campfire at the end of the day, and you were the only one who was there. And it was going to be a little, you know, half hour, maybe before the kids started coming into the campfire and he would just come and sit at the campfire and he wouldn't say anything. And then you get awkward. Cause you're like, Oh God, is he going to tell me I did something wrong? Or like, why is he sitting here? And so then ultimately then the staff member is the one driving the conversation. So does the staff member say, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> you know, or does the staff member say, Oh, I had a beast of a group this week. Like they have been tough. Right. But it was so brilliant. And I used that technique as a camp director all the time that I would, I would find people and just walk with them. And I might say, Hey, how are you? Or I might just be like, Hey, can I walk with you? Yeah. And then not say anything until they felt awkward enough to say something. Um, and because 
one of the greatest assets and resources that you have as a director is your time and attention. And so when you can give time and attention to your staff, that for most folks does speak some kind of volumes and some sort of appreciation on top of the gifts and the notes and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, and I'll also say one of the best exercises I did every year was I, I handed out note cards to the staff and I said, what are your expectations of me as a boss? What are your expectations of me as a boss? And I invited them to write it down. They didn't have to put their names on it. Truthfully, by the end of the year, I knew all their handwriting. So I knew who wrote what eventually, but I did not know it at the beginning <laughs> of the summer. And those cards sat on my desk all summer. And anytime I was having a crummy day, I'd pull them out and read through them. And so often people would say things like, I want you to tell me when there's a better way to do something. I need a high five. Uh, you know, I, I want you to, to correct me if I'm doing something wrong. Um, and that was really empowering, especially the younger leader who's going like, you know, if every time I walk up, they think I'm correcting them. Like, what's that? Is that okay? No. Every time you walk up to a staff member, the first thought they have is, oh my gosh, I'm going to get fired. So <laughs> we need to take that fear away from them and make it more comfortable and help them see that just having some time and space together can be a really beautiful place. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go camp hacker here and have a tip of the week, like an actual tool, <laughs> but it's not mine. I'm going to give all the credit to Kim Acock because she give, she gave, she gave me this idea during a session uh, at I think mid States, but for appreciation, it speaks to what you're talking about, Ruby and you as well, Howie, for how everyone feels that differently, that appreciation is we, she gives everyone in her staff an envelope. So we do this now too, just a little manila envelope. And they put their name at the top and on the left side, they write ways that they can feel appreciated that are $2 or less. So I love Snickers. I like Cheez-Its. I like stickers, pencils, gum, whatever that is. And then the right side, it's ways that I can feel appreciated that are for free. So hugs, high five, tell me I'm doing a great job. Give me a five minute break. That's not technically free. Camp owners know this, but we'll just say it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but that was so monumental for us. And to be able to identify what are your love language, your appreciation languages. And so we would go buy all of that stuff and keep it under our desk. And when it seemed like someone needed that little pick me up or they did something just phenomenal, even if I didn't have time in that moment to say something directly to them, I could put it in their little envelope. It was like their mailbox. But that was huge for us. And that was so brilliant for me with Kim. So that's some little tip of the week Love on that. camp owners. Look at this crossover <laughs> episode and a tip. You're welcome. Look. You're welcome. Kelly, um, amazing. <laughs> well, Kim. We're, get, we're getting an email from Travis after this for sure. <laughs> for sure. I love it. So Ruby, one question that we wanted to ask in a COVID world is, do you think COVID is going to, or has changed our, well, not going to, has it changed our role as bosses and especially this upcoming summer? Yes. How so? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell um, me more. And we're done, and we're yeah, done. Yeah, that's, I mean, yes. <laughs> I mean, I'll say this, the number of times I said over the last year, I'm so glad I'm not a leader right now making decisions that like affect employees and stakeholders. And so number one, acknowledge that you have a difficult job with impossible choices. Uh, and there have been many times over the last year, and I foresee that that's going to continue, honestly, mm -hmm. that there are going to be decisions that it just does not feel like there is a good choice. Um, and that's, that's hard. <laughs> um, so, you know, take a moment to acknowledge that first and foremost. Um, secondly, I think one of the biggest biggest expectations that our staff are going to have is that we're going to keep them safe. And I think that safety, that definition of safety has broadened, um, that it's not just, you know, what maybe on everybody's mind, which is COVID, you know, you're going to keep me safe from the virus, but also like you're going to keep us safe from racial inequality. You're going to make sure that the transgender kids feel safe. Um, and, you know, it, What's tricky is that if you've spent any time with me, you know that I, I uh, help facilitate, again, hold space for like difficult conversations and moving away from the idea of a safe space and more into a brave space. Like camp is not safe. There's a lot of really dangerous stuff we do at camp and the risks that we take are part of the magic of camp. 
that all being said, for all the risks that we take at camp, there is a ton of mitigation that we do to try to prevent the, the big scary incidents that we don't want to have happen. Um, so I, I think really, truly recognizing that it's going to be um, like you need to put on the lens of being an insurance company this year. Like if your insurance company would go, nope, you can't do that then maybe you shouldn't do it this year. It uh, doesn't mean it's gone forever, uh, but, but we really have to mitigate risk and communicate clearly to our staff about why we're making some of the choices that we are. Um, we can't just have the intent of keeping everybody safe. Like we actually have to have the impact of keeping folks as safe as possible. Um, and, and that an abundance of caution is going to be, to, gonna need to be the norm this year. Um, and the caveat to that is it's not just your responsibility as the boss. Everybody has a role in that accountability. And so creating that culture of accountability where you all keep each other safe. And if you're having trouble with that, that's where you as the boss can come in and help facilitate some conversation around problem solving. And in my conversations with uh, staff so far, uh, people who were slated, uh, um, our camps didn't operate in 2020. So we're on the journey, you know, to, to come back. And, you know, it's, it's so interesting when you said you don't have to do this alone. I, I've been so impressed with the eagerness of people to say, Howie, you know, Sari, we're here for you, you know, whatever decisions you feel you need to make, like we're, we're in it, you know, if, if we have to not have this program or this tradition has to be modified and we have to make other decisions, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling really confident that, uh, you know, staff are coming back with a lens of, you know, this is going to be a great story 25 years from now. And I, and I, and I actually use that as part of some of my new applicant onboarding where, you know, you can choose to go to the local, um, you know, grocery store or work at the cinema. And those are great jobs. And you probably will get paid more than you would if you came to camp. I get that. But you got a great story in 25 years that you came out or worked through a pandemic at summer camp and were out. Like, I feel that's the story. And I feel that I'm, I'm, it, it's, that's resonating with people, I think, generally, um, which has been really great. And so it makes me feel like while I do shoulder a lot with a, a core group of people, I think people are ready to, to make it all happen. So uh, I'm really glad you said that, Ruby. Uh, Kelly, I, I don't know about some of your thoughts on that, but that really, I'm really glad Ruby sort of described it that way. So many good things in there, Ruby, but something that struck me that I wrote down is you had said <clears throat> staff are going to expect us to keep them safe and you talked about creating a safe space but also a brave space and something i wrote down was keep me safe but also keep me brave so like yeah keep pushing me so like that could be a tagline right i'm not only going to keep you safe i'm going to keep you brave so i'm going to keep pushing you to be brave and creating a culture and environment for that so i really like that but all of it, Ruby. I have so many notes. I just got so many notes and takes away. Yay. Oh, good, good. Uh, something that I, is off the cuff, Howie, we talked about this earlier. It isn't a question I prepped you for, and we don't necessarily have to have an answer, Ruby or Howie, but it's something that I was thinking about when we were writing these show notes that I wanted to bring up because the last line that we have in a question is to be a good boss, but not bossy. And I'll tell you, honestly, when I was writing out these notes, I was thinking, is there a different word that we can use than boss? And I don't know why I have this little cringe in me when I say boss and thinking of calling myself a boss. I am a boss, but I don't know if it's partly uh, a connotation with it. I don't know if it's being a woman and the word bossy is really close to another B word that can be used. But I think that was a reflection that I had when we were doing the show notes and thinking about this episode. I kept thinking, is there a different word we can use? And I don't know. I don't need to think that way, but I am just being really honest that I have the bossy and the other B word uh, really can feel assimilated for me. Mm -hmm. And that was a thought that I had. Well, I was I was just going to say that when I, I got the pleasure of listening to all the, the women podcast on the Go Camp Pro episode you all were part of, I, it, I was, you know, it, it resonated with me as 
for the women on, on the call on the show to talk about the gender differences with, you know, men being boss and, uh, you know, women being bo perceived as bosses and, and, and how, you know, overcoming some of sort of the innate just, you know, feelings people have about, you know, camp directors, camp owners, whether they're male or female and being the boss. So, you know, it, I, I'd be curious, Ruby, because you're such a great source for this insight with, you know, the conversations you're having on the podcast and the work you do in training. Like, maybe you just want to talk a little bit about, you know, talking to, you know, the gender issues related to the perception of bosses and stuff for a little bit, because I think people are really curious about, you know, because many people I'm sure have overcome or had challenges that, you know, un they didn't need to have because, you know, of their gender. And I, I just thought I would throw that out at you because I think Kelly, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. And, and I think with most topics, this is true. I would start first with your own feelings about the word um, before addressing it with staff or, or, you know, building a training session. Um, it, it's, this is a, a technique too, that came from the, the book, You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. And she, it, she talks about money, like how we have these, these deeply programmed things about money that are messages that maybe no one ever told you explicitly, but you probably feel them inherently. And so you have to recognize what those things are before you can kind of move forward and make changes and teach others and whatever, um, to be able to do it kind of from the healthiest space. So I would say that's true for boss too. Uh, and, you know, to speak to what you said, Kelly, like, if the word boss doesn't feel great for you, that's okay. I'm not saying you have to own it, right? You don't have to reclaim it. Like find the word that feels good for you as a leader. Um, and I think this is one of those situations where we can open up some really interesting dialogue with our staff, especially maybe our leadership team or young leaders who may be going into that boss role for the first time and invite them to do the same thing. Like, what is your relationship with the word boss? <laughs> like. When I say boss, do you have happy feelings or like does your your tummy start to get a little rumbly and unhappy? And and let's you don't have to unpack the trauma, but like let's at least recognize what those feelings are. And then we can unpack a little bit about how what what kind of experience do we want our staff to have when we say I'm your boss, right? Uh, and and how do we want the the experience of being bossed, right? Like being managed. What do we want that to be like at our camp? And let's have our leadership team think about that, talk about that. I think the easiest thing to do is to think about great bosses you've had and terrible bosses you've had. Um, and if people haven't had bosses, if it is their first job, I will often liken it to coaches because most folks have had some sort of coach, be that a sports coach or like a director in theater or dance, performing arts, right? Like everybody pretty much has had some sort of experience with a coach-like figure, maybe even just like a PE teacher, right? Um, and if you can, and, and even if you haven't, right, you can watch a movie about a coach <laughs> and you can make some good observations about what do great coaches do? What do bad coaches do? Uh, and then how does that translate over to a work environment? What's similar, what's different? Um, and then absolutely you can be like, okay, so when I said coach, how many of you all thought of a male? I, like I did, I, I'll be honest, you know, and, and so what's going on with that? Why is that, you know, is that the experience we want our campers to have? Is that the experience we want our staff to have? How can we reprogram that here? Uh, if you're a sports camp, maybe everybody's called coach, you know, or anytime you're at a sports activity, we call the adults coach, right? And so that you get used to seeing this terminology in a different way from how it might be presented outside of camp. Well, I am the proud owner of many movie coaching clips that I use in training. So to our audience out there, I'd be happy to give you my top 10 things to use in training on this a wonderful topic. Coaching is very near and dear. So Ruby, thank you for that plug. But for sure, you know, Coach Carter, remember the Titans, yeah, you know, there's so many <laughs> mighty ducks. Um, and my biggest my newest plug for good stuff around coaching staff is my big plug is it was an inspiration on a previous show is Ted Lasso, the new Apple Plus TV show. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And so anyhow, we should do an episode on just movies for training, movies for camp training. Like we've I, done, be, have you we've done, done that over on camp code? We've done like quick fire um, oh. uh, episodes where we say like 
these 15 clips. We haven't done movies specifically, but we've done right. like 15 yeah. YouTube clips that we always show. And they're always, always well listened to. So yeah, I would oh, highly recommend my, it. My associate director is a um, longtime football coach and he, he that's his go-to. It's so funny. Anyhow, uh, thank you for that. That's wonderful. Kelly, <laughs> any, oh, any Ted Lasso on? puts a smile on my face. You could do an updated version of Camp Code with Ted Lasso in there. Right? So. <laughs> Just an idea. Well, mm -hmm. Ruby, I we could talk forever and we have to be mindful of time and it's just really challenging, but it's, thank you so much. I have so many great notes and takeaways. So on that inspiring feeling, uh, we're gonna move on to the end of our show where we finish with something that's inspiring all of us right now. So Ruby, this can be a book, article, podcast, documentary, leadership quote, anything that's inspiring you to be a better camp professional or a better boss. So I will be a great role model and I will start off with my inspiration and then we'll go to Ruby and then we'll end with Howie. So the thing that I wanted to end with today and share is I have been reading the book, You Are Awesome. And one of our guests, Emma, um, who is a social worker, recommended this, I think almost a year ago, Howie, but I've been slowly going through it and entering, writing notes in my little camp notebook. And something I read the other day really stuck with me. And it was, instead of you win some and you lose some, it was you win some and you learn some. And I felt like I've had a lot of learning the past month, especially I've reached out to Howie and asked for some sage wisdom um, from him, which I appreciate so much. But I really, that stuck with me. And I keep saying that to myself, okay, Kelly, you're going to win some and those are easy. And you're going to learn some and those are going to be hard, but you're going to be better for it and a better boss and a better owner for it. So that's a book that's been great to me with just that quote. I hope that that sticks with someone else too. Ruby, do you want to go? For sure. Uh, so at, when I was asked this question, I think kind of this has been my mantra in the last couple of years, and that is onward ever, backward never. Um, I first saw this in the book Big Magic by Liz Gilbert. Um, and I was looking today because I was like, I think that was in Big Magic. And I was Googling to make sure and but then kind of unpacked a little bit of a rabbit hole. So um, not only is Onward Ever, Backward Never great, but I want to give you a little of the, the history of this phrase. So there was a 2004 book by a woman named Marie Tim uh, that is called Onward Ever, Backward Never. And then um, that phrase actually has roots amongst the West Indians. And they said forward ever, backward never, which was coined by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, which was Ghani's, Ghana's first prime minister and president, which I thought was interesting. So uh, it just feels like in these times that we're just trying to move onward. <laughs> so I try to remind myself of that. Thanks, Ruby. Uh, for me, um, for this show, I have a book that I'm well into that I just can't put down, and that is Adam Grant's latest book. Adam Grant is a very well-known um, Wharton um, school uh, professor. Um, I do follow him on Twitter. He's re really great stuff from him. His latest book is called Think Again, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. And uh, I'm just some of the, the things he's researched and the things that he shares in the book, I think will resonate with everyone in any industry, walk of life, etc. Um, and one of the lines that promotes the book that I, I wanted to share is that we listen to opinions that make us feel good, instead of ideas that make us think hard. And I think that um, whether it's the political climate or all the social issues that we're all facing, you know, camp has always been a place where ideas come and we examine traditions. We had a, a, an episode uh, about, um, you know, addressing the impact of Black Lives Matter and just opening ourselves up to, to listen and think and change. And our, and our camp environments are places where we role model that. And the stuff in the book, I think, could be really inspiring to, to, to you know, give you some, you know, people motivation to tackle some things in, in your own camp that you want to look a little deeper at. So anyhow, think again, Adam Grant. That is my inspiration for today. I love that line, Howie. That's fantastic. That's a good one. So good. Really, really good, really good. Okay, Ruby, how can people get a hold of you if they'd like to have this discussion further? Certainly, you can email me ruby at rubyoutdoors.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at rubyoutdoors or follow me on Twitter at rubylin85. Howie, what about you? 
People can get a hold of me at Howie at CampRobinHood.ca or follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Howie Grossinger. All right. And if individuals like to get a hold of me, they can be reached at, I can be reached at Kelly with a Y at HiddenPinesRanch.com. Please do not forget that you can find all of our show notes at gocamp.pro slash owners pod. You can find the resources that we mentioned this episode and lots of good stuff there from our show and other Go Camp Pro podcasts out there. Howie, always a pleasure. Ruby, this is just <laughs> great. It felt like just talking with friends over yep. a cup of coffee or something else. I really, really enjoyed it. It was fantastic. Thanks for your time and thank you to everyone for listening.